And the Hebrides revival was so sovereign, it happened without a preacher. Yes, preachers came up into it and through it and began, you know, preaching it. But it happened. When it happened, it was like the cloud of glory came down over a whole region. And if you read about that Hebrides revival, there would be people driving in their horse and buggies, feel a conviction of sin. They'd have to stop their horses. They would get down on the side of the road on their knees in the mud and begin repenting and then run to churches. It wasn't one building that was filled. It was all the buildings buildings around all the churches were filled because and then preachers rose up because they people were there and they said what do we do to get saved and they would tell them what to do and Duncan Campbell arose as a as a spokesperson for that but I believe that we are moving into these atmospheric times I just came home last week from the Bethel prophetic conference and um, I sent Bill and Chris a word, I couldn't uh, uh, articulate what I saw in the conference. Wesley and I just loved it and it was probably one of the best times that we've ever been there. Uh, but um, so I wrote them this email and I said, I, I wanted to share what I felt about Bethel Church when I was there. It took me a while to figure out exactly what I was sensing, but the atmosphere was filled with creativity. Like the manifestation of the creator was there. I would compare it to tangibly seeing gold dust in the atmosphere like a glory cloud, only it was as though there were creativity bubbles. It was like they were in the atmosphere went ready to drop on somebody. I felt like the Lord said that because you have stewarded his presence in worship so well for so long, as have Rick and Lori, you know, that everybody's going to have different things. Uh, all 12 tribes had different anointings, and we might have some of that too, but, but um, that you have stewarded his presence in worship for so well for so long. He was rewarding you with creative revolution, revelation to change society. People will be in the middle of worship and get downloads about how to solve problems, invent inventions, forerun technology that hasn't been created yet, stuff like that. And I felt because you allowed, first of all, in the house, you know, all kinds of creativity to flourish, worship, dance, artists, painters, songwriters, film, etc. The next phase of Bethel is to take the creativity of the creator to solve world problems. I've never seen those create creativity bubbles anywhere in the world before. And I said, I believe that Bethel is expanding to frontiers that many churches never get to. I saw believers and unbelievers alike coming to learn from the training centers that Bethel will raise up. And, uh, you know, schools of governance to equip people to do that. And they, are, they just started an innovation center. They're doing all kinds of things. But it's a more uh, a mindset a non-limiting mindset where you can, you can do whatever you want. You know, when I was 16 years old, my mother, I said, Mom, I, I want to be an interpreter for international affairs. And, and, uh, but I said, I don't think our family has enough money because I'd have to not only go to university, I have to, you know, travel to Europe and go to a school and cost too much money and blah, blah, blah. And, and my mother looked at me and said, Stacy, you can be whatever you want. So it might take a little longer. You might have to work a little harder. But don't let money ever stop your dreams. So that's like God. You can be whatever you want. And, you know, we have a testimony. So I was sharing with this couple, Lorraine, if you just want to quickly come here. Um, uh, uh, this, what I saw in Bethel about these creativity bubbles. And she said, that happened to me in Bethel. That happened to me in Bethel. So I just want her to come and give just a one minute little quick synopsis of how it happened and where it took her from nothing she was doing into something that she'd never done before. Yes, this is a, it was at a Bethel um, wor workshop for our writers. And that morning I had gotten a contract with Chosen Books to write a book, a prayer directive on how to pray over the Middle East. It's called Love in the Face of Isis. And two film directors were speaking that evening about filmmaking. And there was actually, they were speaking to this side of the audience. And I was over there and they're saying, you know, what God's going to do for you tonight is going to be something that's going to advance your career five years into the future. And I'm just like, well, God bless that person. I have no interest uh -huh. whatsoever in screenwriting. 
But as they were speaking, they said, if you have a title that sounds like a movie and we haven't seen it before, you can hook a producer by the strength of the title alone. And my husband turned to me and he said, the name of your book is a hook for a movie, Love in the Face of Isis. And I sat in my seat and I said, okay, I know that that's true. God, but this is a book about prayer. If you want this to be a movie, then what's the story? And immediately he opened up the screen and I watched a film from start to finish. Wow. He said, you're gonna Come write on. this, you're gonna write this movie. And he gave me the whole framework. But the point of this is, is that what Stacy is saying, Bethel creates a place and an atmosphere of worship. And we had just come out of an amazing worship time, even in that conference. Mm -hmm. And so the glory was still hovering mm -hmm. for me to just say yes to the Lord. And so I did write that screenplay. It got picked up. Um, and then... God took us out of obscurity into a place now we're pastors to the entertainment industry. We've been on two movie sets already as a prayer team, which is unheard of in the industry, to have two people be on set every day praying over the films and over the cast and the crew. So, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you. See, so she began to do something she's never done before. But we had this one lady that she had four kids. And she had a dream about fashion. Her name is Nancy Vu. She had a dream. She had never done fashion in her life. She got pictures. She began to draw them. She has now become a fashion designer that's doing uh, runways for in New York. The, the Medici family in Italy is talking to her. She's just like out of nothing. And this is, might happen to you. You know, this might happen to you that God will call you. And, and this atmospheric shift that Paul Cain saw, he said this, that, uh, that uh, it, it, it was so big that, uh, and Rick and I were there for a meal in Wesley and Lori, when Paul Cain was talking about it, he said, it wasn't a planned event. It was a move of God so big that that stadiums were the only places big enough to hold the crowds that were coming. It wasn't a planned event like the call or the send, which are awesome. And I have personally put on calls in multiple nations of the earth with, you know, 10,000 people, 15,000 people, and many, many, and over and over again. And I love those things. But, but what Paul Cain saw was bigger than that. Sovereign powerful. And I, I believe that God wants to take our eyes up and fix them firmly on him and begin to contend for those kinds of moves that are so big. And even personally, that you will be launched into something you've never done before. You might move from a prayer director writing a prayer book into a movie producer, into pastoring film artists, because God wants to take you exceedingly above what you can ask or even think.